Um, the past lives with us in different ways. Um, in our discourse in the small institute I'm leading in Hungary, Kursag, the Institute of Advanced Study, we very often talk about dogma um, versus reality, dogma versus care. And um, in the last couple of centuries, I think dogma uh, dominated um, a big idea, hmm? an illusion which was mixed up with reality, re um, dominated European um, realities. Um, that was combined, unfortunately, with a lot of ignorance and negligence, um, namely now about Eastern Central Europe. Why did it happen? Um, during the Cold War, um, it seemed to everyone, that was the dominating code, the dominating knowledge, that um, nothing, nobody can change the system of bipolar logic, the Yalta system, so to speak. So any kind of attempt to change it is based upon craziness, um, futile romanticism, idealism. Take 56 in Hungary. People might thought that it was heroic, but was completely useless because the Soviet domination uh, cannot be changed from below. That was the general knowledge. Meanwhile, um, that was the first crack um, in the mindset of Western European um, intelligentsia, um, as referred to um, by Chantal. People like Jean-Paul Sartre, who was a member of the French Communist Party, left the Communist Party, and many others turned very sharply against this kind of hero um, heroic uh, understanding of Soviet type of communism, like Albert Camus. And so there was a kind of a movement towards understanding realities in Eastern Central Europe. But because it was a failure, it was a tragedy, um, we, it, it could have disappeared. Um, Eastern Central European reality was different, however. Um, people, and this is my point, and I completely agree that Solidarność played a crucial role in changing uh, history in Europe, and maybe, maybe also globally. Uh, people like Adam Mishnik and, and his friends in the Catholic Church and intellectuals, etc., were able to draw conclusions from, from the tragedy of an armed um, revolution or revolt which was 56. And they concluded that we have to try in a different way, being nonviolent, not to let communist authorities to provoke us into any kind of armed conflict, but never give up questioning them. And that, is a, that was a new way of thinking, a new haltung, a new approach of civil society versus the state, versus the authoritarian state. And unfortunately, this history is not very well known it's not in the uh, history books, so I'm just making a comment in parenthesis. Some of our colleagues from the West um, are of the conviction, conviction that unless the history of the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s of Eastern Central Europe is not understood and digested by our Western counterparts, there would not be any chance to create a European identity. And especially true with, with the story of Solidarność. Um, as um, Marcus mentioned, at the end of, of the heroic um, organization, a mobilization of Solidarność, they reached their purpose. There was a non-violent agreement between communist authorities and so-called civil society, which actually was the, the biggest working class movement of 20th century, or maybe the whole world. The greatest irony that workers in a worker state had to figure how to talk to their authorities. And they did. So that was nonviolence and that based on dialogue. And, um, and, when, and that for me personally and many people in Hungary and as well in Eastern Central Europe, that was the moment when we understood that neither Soviet Union nor the Polish Communist Party can destroy Solidarność. They were pushed on the ground, but they survived. That was in 81, 82. Then we understood, some of us, that there is a possibility to change the Soviet rule. But that was a very tiny minority. The general understanding was still, up until 89, that it is not possible. So that's a big, big, big uh, uh, distinction, a big gap between understanding history from below, 
when you are a member of Solidarność, 10 million people were at a certain moment Solidarność uh, members on the ground, including Communist Party secretaries. That was, you know, they had a double life. When you are doing it, creating networks, do, uh, every day, Solidarność, Solidarity, and then when you are watching it from, from prestigious American universities. So I, let me finish this first part with a personal um, uh, story when I had a chance first to, um, to, to go to the Golden West for a longer time. In um, 88, 89, I got this um, very prestigious scholarship. Um, SSRC MacArthur I went to Berkeley, Harvard, etc. And I started to give seminars. And the, 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 the answer was, young man, be careful. There was 89. April, be careful, understand your ent enthusiasm, but if the Soviet tanks are coming, we are not going to come and help you. So that's a huge, huge gap in understanding, and that was also the ongoing discourse for a while that nothing can change um, the Alta system. And I don't want to hear to, to um, propagate that it was Solidarność and a few movements in Eastern Central Europe. It was much more. It was also a kind of networking between East and West, which is also forgotten. There, were, there was a strong West European peace movement. And the best people in this peace movement understood um, that there is a necessity to cooperate with East European uh, democratic movements, even if their goals and efforts are very different. And again, this is not known for many of the historians. It's not in the in history, but that was a, the first network I participated in, uh, was uh, established in 1884 in Perugia, the European Nuclear Disarmament Convention um, uh, time. Some people decided to create a network for East-West dialogue. And then there was a trickle-down effect. I don't go further because that will be too, too long, but that, was, that hit young Hungarian students. Some of them are in government today. That was a European networking. There was a vision that it is possible to have a common Europe. There was solidar solidarity from the Western side. People in Holland came to visit us, invited us. So that was a kind of emerging European civil society, which is unfortunately nowhere today. So that was a turning point. I wrote books about it, so, uh, imagining the, the, the impossible, redefining the boundaries of the possible. That was 89, 91, when the Soviet troops left Eastern Central Europe. And that is another turning point now. That time, we had a positive direction. The arrow of time went up, uh, up upward spiral. And today, we have a down, 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 downward spiral. It's going down. Um, there was optimism then. There was a, there's a lot of pessimism and fear today. That would be probably a, another round of discussion, when I'm, uh, another round of, of exchange, and I'm going to come back to this point. I think um, European integration is <clears throat> one of the greatest success stories um, in the 20th and 21st century. Um, and with all of these difficulties and crises we are facing today, it still is. But here we have to come back to the issue of <clears throat> that was raised yesterday and the day before yesterday about the, the unit of analysis, which is the nation state or what? Well, Europe um, <clears throat> is um, a very successful peace project. Hmm? This is how it was established after the Second World War. I don't go into the history because probably you know better than I do. <clears throat> but without the understanding of the tragedies of the First and the Second World War, it would not have been possible to overcome uh, the old and very strong, strongly institutionalized uh, um, capacities um, of the nation state. Now, a new vision was born, and people, that was a, again a movement from below, and of course then it became a kind of elite-driven um, project. But the very purpose was to make it sure, to give guarantees that no more war will um, occur from European terrain. Now, if you look at today um, on, on opinion polls, which I highly recommend to you, but Hungarians are very, very pro-European today, very, in a contradictory way. Um, 30% of, of Europeans believe that war is possible and will occur in, 20, in 10 to 20 years. 
Meanwhile, and that's again a paradox, we live in a very, very paradoxical time. Meanwhile, they also think that the EU is a good thing. But they, again, they say that it will be dissolved. So uh, what happened? I think what happened is that, as it was described by both of, uh, of, of the other two other panelists, we came to this common game from the eastern part of Europe and the western part of Europe with two very different kinds of aspirations, packages, if you want. First of all, we have to think about 1891. It was not expected. And honestly, and this should be a, a, new, a new task for historians to analyze, not very welcome. <laughs> not very welcome. And then only afterwards came triumphalism, what Gorbachev told 10 years ago, um, when it was the, 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 one of the celebrations of the fall of the Berlin Wall, he came to Berlin and um, told Western leaders that this is not what, what hap what's happening, is not what you have promised when I offered unilateral um, <clears throat> um, stop of an arms race from the Soviet side, then we agreed that we are going to build something together, a future for Europe, European village, and a future for the world. And what, what we got instead is triumphalism, Western triumphalism, led by the United States and also echoed by Western European powers. And that led again to the rise of Gorbachev, the rise of, Gorbachev, uh, of, 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 of Putin after Yeltsin, and, and a kind of completely alienated Russia. Even in the late 90s, there was a chance to bring Russia closer to the NATO, to create a strong cooperation that is forgotten today. Nobody speaks about it. Because there are powerful um, players uncontrollable democratically in the world, whose interest is probably to continue a certain version of the Cold War, at least the spirit, at least the arms race. Okay? And here is the failure of what we call Europe or the European Union. Instead of being able to create what it was promised, a new political space, a supranational play field for building supranational or transnational democracy, there is a relapse since the end of the 90s, early 2000s, to the nation state paradigm. What does it mean? That the strongest has the, the biggest chance to speak out. I'm not going to go to, to politics, but that's German Europe, the danger of German Europe, which was raised by famous German philosophers and sociologists like Ulrich Beck. It's not because Germany wanted to be an aggressive power, but this is the logic of the nation state. Yeah? And that was never, never discussed, never really understood. That, some, that, that was a shift within the process of, of integration. And now we have a chaotic and, um, how to say, um, a, a, a kind of an order which is rather a disorder, an anarchistic European integration where everyone is mutually blaming the other one. Uh, it's the game of mutual accusations, very little understanding about the common future, and the end of which is that people in Europe believe that war is again possible. So this needs to be understood. Meanwhile, people also see that Europe is, as mentioned here, Europe is probably the best of the possible worlds. So these are internal contradictions which need to be analyzed and uh, discussed. And uh, here I think Central Europe plays a role there is, an, not just Poland, sorry, the entire region of East and Central Europe, huh, including Ukraine, trying to emancipate itself. Our voice was not being heard. We were told, as I gave you my personal example, that it is an unimportant, negligible part of the world. When I was in the U.S. for two years, I was told not to deal with Eastern Europe because it's not an important target for the U.S. Change my research topic. Civil society doesn't exist. It's a blah, blah. Um, now, the situation is very different today, but what you see, what you call populism, is actually a new provocation to bring up the, the points of view of, of, of the abandoned. As Chantal Mouffe, um, another famous French political philosopher, mentions in her books, um, populism is not from the devil. 
there are very different versions of populism, and actually populism is able to create new frontiers for the discussion, for the political debate. It creates its own audience, its own community, and it, it provokes um, a new debate about the future of politics. So this is what is happening. And that's another paradox I wanted to mention, that <laughs> meanwhile, mainstream um, politics, that means social democracy, and Christian democracy was not able uh, <clears throat> to vitalize a debate about, about the European demos and the European political space. That kind of um, new political movement, populism, was able to, and that's the paradox of, of nationalism, or whatever you call it, right-wing extremism, that they are unable to do it by themselves. They have to create an alliance on the European level. So that might be this paradox might be the revitalization of the European uh, or, or the creation of the European political space. Um, that's of course an optimistic version. I'm not propagating populism, but um, <clears throat> again, the, those who were abandoned, if we are talking about democracy, have they have a right to speak out. And that's a global phenomenon in the United States, in the United Kingdom, etc. Close to 50% of society resists, hello, I'm here, and I don't agree with you. I think um, liberal democracy is anti-democratic. And this is, this is again, uh, our challenge to rediscuss and rethink um, old notions, old concepts which are not able to describe with which we cannot describe and analyze reality. So uh, what I'm suggesting here for historians and non-historians um, to work on this, um, we need new, a new kind of understanding of these complexities, because if we just propagate a certain political vocabulary which belongs to an era which is now actually falling apart, then we are, we are not going to get closer to any uh, solutions.